Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to Pillow Talk with Dr. Boyce and Dr. Alicia Watkins. My name is Dr. Boyce Watkins, and I'm here with my lovely wife, Dr. Alicia Watkins. How are you doing today, babe? I'm pretty good. How are you tonight? Doing good, doing good. We just watched um, mm -hmm. about, what, two and a half episodes or three episodes of the Colin Kaepernick documentary. Uh, uh, I think it's Colin Kaepernick in black and white or something like that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we were watching this thing by Colin Kaepernick, and I... And we thought it would be kind of fun to like for people to hear from like two nerdy black professors, um, you know, in terms of what we were seeing in this documentary. Um, and I think it's also interesting because like our our educational backgrounds are different, right? Like you are in social work, and I'm in finance, so <clears throat> we sometimes see things different. And also, I'm a man, you're a woman, which is quite evident as we lay here in the bed together. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Yes, it so, is. So what struck out in, with you? Anything um, in particular? Oh, look. Look who's in here. Yeah, we got a lot of people. Sherwin and yeah. Adrena and Vince and Brock. Brock said that shit was funny as hell. What was funny? I grew funny? up in that environment. He said the, the Colin Kaepernick thing. Oh, okay. What was funny about the Colin Kaepernick? It, well, it, was, it was well done. It was well done yeah like i feel like i, I, like, I feel like cap yeah, i mean you know it's like a, it's interesting to watch that's what i thought what'd you think yeah i like watching docu-series so it's it's like he's narrating but he's also like sitting there watching himself as a child i like i just like that and then commenting on it it's like he's watching it with us and we're sitting down with colin kaepernick having a conversation about his life oh uh, it's pretty it's pretty interesting to see that yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it seemed like he, um, you know, I, I, it was interesting, right? Like, you know, Colin, it was interesting just to hear him talk. Yeah, because we never hear him speak. Like, all the time, um, the, all the controversy, I think it's kind of died down now. Are we now standing for the um, Star Spangled Banner? Are we not? What's going on now with football boys? Um, I think the Kaepernick protests are. I don't know. What do y'all think? I mean, is, is, this, is the Kaepernick standing. stuff still happening? Like, is that done? The protests? Like, I, I, know, I It seemed like it all kind of died down at the end of Trump's presidency, but I don't know. That's so just, true. That's a good point. <laughs> it just, it's kind of cool that we finally hear his voice. Mm. We finally hear what he has to say. And then not only that, but we get a picture of the very dynamic sort of experiences he had as a child growing up with adopted parents did not know he was adopted at all i well, thought yeah go, i thought that maybe his mom like had him with the black guy and then married this man you know it didn't feel like a parental situation well his mama the, mm -hmm. they presented his mama like like she was like a, a borderline clueless white woman she really was clueless. she was they were kind of aloof to some of the experiences that he was going through. It's like, if you're going to adopt a black child, you know, transracial adoptions, you should get into the world of black people more often. It's like they, they really, she just was like, oh, is this how hair works? Or is, where's the barbershop? It's in the back of the store. Like, <laughs> yeah, but the way he, I know a lot of white people didn't know about black culture way more than that mama did. Well, you know, the way they portrayed <laughs> it was that his mother, First of all, let me give you the background. His okay. uh, father, um, nobody knows who his father is. Like they, they were wow. like his daddy, some dude that just, you know, got his mama pregnant. His mama's name was Heidi, and Heidi <laughs> um, put him up for adoption. They Heidi broke up with the daddy um, before Colin was born. Okay. And then um, when Colin was five weeks old, his mom would put him up for adoption. So, you know, I mean, if you really want to understand. Colin Kaepernick, in my view, mm -hmm. you got to start there, right? Here's a guy who was abandoned by both his parents. So he was like a man without a country. Yeah, well, I mean, he doesn't have any memory of that, of course, that abandonment. Like, all he's known, right? all he's ever known are the two parents that he considers his parents. But, I mean, mm -hmm. the glaring fact is that he looks way different from them. I mean, you have any sort of remote understanding of biology, you know that there's no way he could be... <laughs> could be biologically related to them so it's mm -hmm. kind of like a glaring fact that he was adopted so it's not like he has to come oh i was adopted i had no idea no, no but i i, I, I can, mm -hmm. but i can tell you as a kid who was adopted i was adopted my mother was with me my whole right. life mm -hmm. but my father was not there and it wasn't so much that 
I, I don't remember my father not being there. You know, right. the guy that raised me was is my dad. It's more like you look at that those cousins you have and, and stuff, and you know they're not your biological blood relatives. Mm-hmm. So you can feel detached. You do feel and detached. And you, you've mentioned that. I think you've, you've actually diagnosed me with some sort of attachment disorder. Because I told you how I don't even remember. I don't even keep that many friends. Like, I, like if you ask me to name, like, Five friends I had in college. I can't name five friends from college. A lot of people know me from college, you know, because I became more famous or whatever. But I don't remember. I just, every step of my life, I just moved on. It was like I didn't feel like I needed to stick around Mm -hmm. anywhere. Okay, so I don't know if it's related to you being adopted by your father. But I think what's important is that you did have a biological mother and she had her family that you are genetically related to. But what I think is really interesting is that you did have a biological father who lived right there in that same city yeah. that you grew up in. So I'm like always kind of curious as to, okay, so things didn't work out with your biological father, but you had all these other family members right there in the city. So I always like curious yeah. about like, how is it? I guess that's a question I'd have to ask your parents. Like, how is it you never really connected with those individuals? Cause not everybody is bad. Right? Um, that's true. But I mean, it's like what you're comfortable with. And mm-hmm. the reason I say all that is because I, I wonder if Colin, cause I'm going to just tell you, like, I like Colin Kaepernick, right? I like what he's trying to do. I just am not completely convinced that what Colin Kaepernick was doing with his protests was very effective. Yeah, I, you know, I'm gonna tell you, I agree with you. I think that, um, I think this documentary is way more effective than the protest was. <laughs> like it, the documentary, like he starts the documentary with like some real facts about, you know, something historical. So we, we've only seen three. Is have we seen three episodes so far? I think it's yeah, only like, three. Like two and a half. Two and a half, and so it just looks like it begins like really powerful. At the beginning of each episode, he's given facts. Yeah. You know, he's I, I, given really interesting information. Like the second episode. So this is a spoiler if people hadn't seen it. So you might want to watch this with caution. But um, the second episode in particular, I mean, he talks about you need this white stamp of approval in order to be accepted. And what's pretty interesting is that the white stamp of approval has to come from the very people who are taking care of him. Yeah, but yeah. Here, here's the thing. Um, <clears throat> what I see when I see Colin's documentary is it reminds me of another movie called Dear White People. And mm-hmm. the, where Colin and I are not the same ideologically. It doesn't mean, I, doesn't mean I dislike Colin. I think Colin's great. But he reminds me of myself when I was in my 20s, too. When, mm-hmm. I, was, when I was in my 20s, I used to think everything was about what white people think about us. Right. Everything's about proving white people wrong. Everything, microaggressions. Why are white people looking at me like that? Why are white people talking to me like that? Why white? Why won't white people get? Why me can't to- I eat that apple like everybody else? Right. I ate apples. <laughs> I can't have ice cream. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. He got. He had the part where he got mad because they wouldn't give him extra ice cream like they gave the white he boys. Was like, keep your funky ice cream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, and and the thing was, and there was a whole lot of conversation about, you uh-huh. know, white people don't like my hairstyle. White people don't like my music. Yeah. And and then I, there was a point when I was maybe in my 30s right. where it hit me. And I was like, who gives a fuck what white people think? Well, see, that's the interesting. I think that Colin Kaepernick would agree with you. Like, if he was listening to this now, maybe he will. I don't know. He would agree with you, boys. He would say, yeah, I really don't care anymore. But I used to care. Like, No, I he, think, he does care. I don't think he does. I think he does because the whole documentary I is about. I think he did. No, the whole documentary is about white reactions to black culture. That's what, like, that. you could summarize 70%. Uh, and I'm not criticizing. I'm not uh-huh. complaining. I'm not, I'm not in any way dis- I'm just saying um, Uh that people don't, I think people don't quite understand that when you're obsessing over what white people think about this and what they think about that and what white people did and what white people are not doing, that's a type of white supremacy right there. Okay. Like that's, that's honoring white people by, by caring about their opinion. They think about this. I ask everybody, give me a yes or no. Yes or no. Do white people sit around wondering what we think? Do white people sit around wondering <clears throat> why we don't approve of them? Do white people sit around and say, gosh, black people, they I was playing my country music and I had my Trump flag and black people, black people, they just get so mad because because I play country music. Like they don't do that. Cause they don't give a shit. Yeah. So I think um I think you're right about that. 
I think Colin, Colin Kaepernick is probably agreeing with you, but I think what is, what's happening in this documentary is that he's telling his story. So all of us have this story too, you know, similar mm -hmm. story. Think about it. I mean, he's the only black person in his whole family, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. he, here he is living there and living in this neighborhood. He made it very clear that, you know, I went from all white neighborhood to yet another all white neighborhood. So he's never, he didn't really have that sense of identity development that's very important with, you know, in biracial people. And so he's saying that he had to actually release himself from what white people think of him. And I'm telling you the story about how I became the Colin Kaepernick that I became. So I think it's more of a, because I'm really interested to, we should do another pillow talk when we're done with the entire um, docu-series. But I think he's getting to that point where he's he's like right where you are, but he's telling the story about, it's a transition story about how he is starting to develop his own identity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I will say that, you know, I watched it. It's very entertaining, right? Like, I think that the documentary was great. Very um, intelligently done. But, but remember, it's, mm -hmm. it's like, I don't believe black people are ever going to be free and liberated as long as all we know how to do is to complain about what it's like to be in the white man's cage. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Like, because remember, like, mm -hmm. you know, this, this, there's a black liberal ideology here that underscores. So that's why I compared it to dear white people, mm -hmm. dear white people, in my view, <clears throat> from what I've seen of it is built on this sort of transracial coalition. Cause remember when Dave Chappelle challenged cancel culture, it was one of the executive producers from dear white people, a trans person, who went after Dave Chappelle because, you know, and, and she went after him because he, he didn't fit the company line. He did sort of fit the white liberal ideology. He was coming in and saying, you know, some mm -hmm. things that they didn't approve of. So that, you know, what, what this is built on, and it happens a lot on college campuses um, where there is an indoctrination process where black, you have the black student who goes to, you know, Yale mm -hmm. or Brown. Mm -hmm. And in order to be, you know, in order to be black, they express their blackness by saying, you know, I'm going to wear my hair in braids and my professor wanted to touch my hair. And that's mm -hmm. so racist. And and how dare you? And and you're issuing microaggressions and and, you know, and, and homophobia. And you got these weird coalitions and all that. When the reality is that most of that dialogue, that those interactions, in my opinion, have never, ever improve the lives of the masses of black people yeah like you know like like and that's what i mean like i i don't think like remember colin colin kaepernick did a very important thing when he got on that one knee and protested you know thing brought attention to police brutality but then there were also people who said but you, did you where did the lives of black people actually improve as a result of the protest and also when you're protesting in a certain way you're kind of saying to white people that when you treat us better that when you all decide to be nice to us again, or, or or for the first time, our lives will improve. So you almost need this white, weird white partnership mm -hmm. in order for you to earn your dignity. And I, I just, I just don't necessarily believe I need white people to come along for me to reclaim my humanity. Right, exactly. So you're further along in your uh, racial identity development. So at the beginning, you know, this happens early on for a lot of uh, people of color. I remember reading this. Um, I teach this in, at the university, at the university voice. Mm -hmm. And um, we talk about black identity development. And it really starts with that one moment where that one, because remember he's with his friend, his baseball friend, and like he has this glaring, even with his parents. Why is his mom so aloof? Like obvious um, racism and discrimination that he's like hello how come no one else sees this he feels alone it's like i see what's going on nobody else around me can see what's happening that this lady won't let me eat this apple or eat the cookie and is glaring um discrimination happening and there's no one else there to kind of stand up for him that one incident is the first step in your um, racial identity development. It's noticing racism, turning the television on and noticing the images that you see in the media, which he did talk about in the documentary. Um, it, you know, it's all of those instances. And then having your white friends who you like and trust and even your mom and your dad 
who should be there for you, sticking up for you. They did not do that for him because they didn't see that. And and even in watching the documentary, I remember thinking, God, he needs a black mama because <laughs> a black mama would know what to do with the hair. The black mom would be more in tune with him. The black mom would be like, hey, you're not going to treat my baby that way. You know, he's going to have somebody who sticks up for him. So the fact that I, I think that he was just so alone in it all make, makes you think that there's, you know, I'm certain he probably felt like, wow, there's something wrong with me because everybody around me is not experiencing this. I'm seeing something no one else is seeing. Well, so it's just, well, let's it's talk just about part that. of that development. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's talk about that. You know, remember Colin is a black kid who was raised in a white family. So he saw how white people lived and probably grew up thinking he was one of them. And then you start, well, just not, well hold on, wait, then yeah. you, wait, let me finish. Mm -hmm. Then you start realizing that you're different. Right. And um, and then you start realizing you're, you're, you're getting treated different. So I can understand how that would piss you off because right. you're sitting there thinking, mm -hmm. oh, my friends are white. I should be getting treated the same way they're being treated. This is crazy. This is horrible. Right. And and I've seen that. Right. I've seen the black people who become incredibly outraged and become super black when they realize that they're actually black. Right. Like you realize mm -hmm. that, you know, like like if you grow up, but if you grow up kind of knowing like like when I grew up in Kentucky, I just kind of knew just from my grandmother and grandparents mm -hmm. telling me things I understood being black means white people aren't going to love you as much as they love themselves and it didn't shock me you know whereas I'd have a friend who might think I think about one friend in particular who thought he was white he did what white people did he talked like white people hung around white people so when he experienced real racism he just he was like what is this this is unbelievable this is an yeah. outrage and, and I was like dude calm down like, yeah it's it's so funny how um it happens a lot when people go to college. So you get a lot of uh, black kids who go to like predominantly white um, high schools, but they go to college and then they get into their blackness when they in college because they start to get around a little more, more diversity sometimes. And so they're joined the, um, what do they join? The black student association the black student. and they'll join that. And it is just a necessary part in their development. And then, but eventually you get to the point where you just, where you were at the beginning of our conversation, where you just like, forget it. I don't care what they think, you know, I'm going to do my own thing. So, yeah. I well, think. you know, and, and I, I, I kind of feel like, and by the way, you're listening to Pillow Talk with Dr. Boyce and Dr. Alicia Watkins. Uh, my name is Dr. Boyce Watkins, and this is my lovely wife, Dr. Alicia Watkins. And uh, if you want to actually be a Patreon on this channel, you can go to intelligentblackpeople.com. Uh, we like to have smart conversations, or try to, <laughs> anyway, uh, about the things that, that we're all seeing in the media. And so, so let me let me kind of dive in, like in terms of what I see with the Colin Kaepernick thing. I think that um, what my guess on Kaepernick is that you know, okay, so he's a black kid who grew up with white parents, didn't feel he he felt like felt connected, right? Like they're raising him like a white boy. Um, he realizes he's not white. He realizes he's black. And I, I think that that was very hurtful and hard for him. And then there's a lot of well, I, the I things feel, I saw. I would have felt so lonely. I can't imagine how he just felt really lonely. I mean, he did have that one black friend, you know, who seemed to like introduce him to Corn Rolls and Allen Iverson. Oh, my goodness. Shout out right. to how and he that, really. And that, and that that's. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Let me let me jump in on that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. So think about this. Right. What are the what are the um, when you talk about what it means to be black? Well, mm -hmm. well, it's a lot of it's very what they call black culture. It's black. Right. It's cultural, right? It's your hair. It's the music. It's um, sports, right? And then it's also maybe something like police brutality. Okay, fine. Um, one of the problems with that though is that there are lots of manifestations of blackness that don't have anything to do with what hairstyle you have or whether you can dribble a basketball right um black to in my view blackness uh, can relate to connecting to your humanity right just just being a human being and a human being doesn't have to have cornrows they don't have to know how to dribble basketball they don't have to listen to hip-hop mm -hmm. you're just a human you just live and that's it the, you know being black is not the first thing people know about you and i think that um, as Kaepernick was searching for his mm -hmm. identity, I feel like he, to some extent, could be defined as one of those biracial people who overcompensates. Yeah, I mean, he definitely, I mean, that now just reminded me, the very first episode began on, he talked about media. He talked about mm -hmm. media, Im media's images. He talked about um, football mimicking, mm -hmm. you know, slave auctions. Mm -hmm. So he, he is very much aware 
of the fact that cornrows was part of the black culture that was placed on him yeah. because he began the episode telling you already, I know you're going to talk about cornrows in the media in some sense, but here I'm just telling you where it comes from and how I got suckered in and I played along. Well, there is it's, a, it's really like a confessional well, on the, his part. Well, there mm -hmm. is a deep, rich mm -hmm. oh, uh, analysis that can be done on just the way I like the way he compared the the NFL um, combine to the slave auction, right? Yeah. You know, look at yeah. how big that Negro is. Look at how strong he is. Look at how <laughs> how high he can jump. I get that part, right? You know, it's all about sort of for hundreds of years marveling at the physical prowess of the black male. Right. And and then the NFL itself and the NBA is a manifestation of the fact that they used to breed black people like animals. They bred us to make create the superhumans. Yeah. Right. And that's what they don't talk about it. But, but we know what happened. They had entire farms, entire fa like, like Negro factories where they would just make black people have sex and make babies. Right. So so here's the thing, though. Right. Let's be clear, though. Being in the NFL ain't no goddamn slave auction. NFL athletes are at the combine because they want to be mm -hmm. at the slave auction. You had no damn choice for the most part, unless your choice was death. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. that's the first thing. It, then the second thing is these dudes are all lining up for the chance to make millions of dollars. I ain't nobody going to feel sorry yeah. for. Yeah, okay. I think so. But I mean, you know, just think about the, the life of a, a professional football player. I mean, you're in the league not very long. Not many people are well, in there. It's very a terrible long. profession. It is. It is well, awful. Most players. Go ahead. Sorry. I I just think it's awful all around. I mean, the concussions that people get. Your 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 time in the in in FL in particular is very short. Maybe a couple of seasons, and you're out. You know. So it's and then you never get those brain cells back from all those concussions. So it's it's pretty hazardous, and I think. Maybe that's kind of what he was saying, you know, in a sense. I mean, um, mm -hmm. well, I, I, I definitely don't, you know, I wouldn't want my son playing in the NFL. But at the same time, though, let me just say why I stood corrected just a little bit, possibly. Mm -hmm. um, at the All Black National Convention, a brother came up to me and he was super tall. He's about six foot eight. Oh, gosh. And okay. he, he said to me, he said, Dr. Boyce, I, I listen to you all the time and I respect everything, a lot of what you have to say. But I have to disagree with you about what you said about being in the NFL. He said, it's not as bad as you think. He literally said that to me. He said, I played for the, he said, I played for the Jets and the New York Jets for seven years mm -hmm. and the Patriots for two years. I believe that that's what he said. And, um, <clears throat> and it turned out, I said, wait, I guess this position, I guess he was a defensive end. He said, no, he was a tight end. Oh, a tight and, okay. and he basically said, he said, man, he said, you know, I played all, I played 10 years and I'm fine. And a lot of my friends are fine. You know, he okay. said, so, so <laughs> he's his, fine. You should have asked him to count backwards. I know, from right? I know. <laughs> no, but let me tell you, he was a very intelligent brother. Very intelligent. Okay. He brought his whole family to the convention, you know? Okay. I, and, and so, so, you know, so obviously he didn't fit anywhere near any stereotype with a dumb jock or anything like that. And I listened to him and I said, thank you for sharing um, that perspective mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. now and and so with the thing with kaepernick as well you know when you're talking about i get that right i totally get what he's saying about the the potential comparison the nfl to slave auctions and and the white man's in control the white man's approval mm -hmm. right but you remember i think cap made a hundred million dollars from the nfl you know and then and then and then his um the nike contract remember he made right quite I mean, a bit from right. the nike contract yeah so so i mean Dude, that's what he got out of the protest brother you got paid <laughs> nigga you ain't you ain't kunta kente that's what I'm saying. you ain't kunta kente and he got a uh, contract with netflix yeah he's gonna do i mean my well. man is paid <laughs> like okay you know so i'm not saying well he could get paid and go away somewhere but he didn't get paid and go away he got paid and he's running with it well, let me just say you know what <laughs> He didn't have to do this documentary. Let me just ask everybody listening. Yes <laughs> or no? Colin Kaepernick made over $100 million. If, if you could trade lives with Kaepernick, <laughs> would you do it? Like, if you could be as rich as him and, and have what he had and go through what he was, he's gone through, <clears throat> would you would you make that trade? You know, so so I, I, I would say that, you know, when you're talking about Kaepernick's experience, you got to be real careful about you know, fantasy versus facts, right? Here are the facts. <clears throat> Kaepernick did a great job highlighting police brutality. 
that you know i thought that was great i yeah. love you know for whatever reason he was doing it i love the way he used his platform mm -hmm. to draw attention to a very important issue yeah he raised awareness just i think this documentary he's also raising awareness too i mean not everybody knows the history of you know hip-hop like that and DJ Herc, whatever. Cool Herc. Like, cool Herc. I mean, he really was the founder of hip hop. Like, like, that's just great. Well, you know, so he, right. he's doing a good job there raising awareness. He did. Okay, mm -hmm. but let me finish. I wasn't go ahead. Done yet. I wasn't All right, done. go ahead. Okay. I just want to add to what you're saying. Yes, he did. He absolutely did. Okay, he did a good <laughs> job of raising awareness. He did more than most. Mm -hmm. Let's be clear. Um, I think that the question that I would end up asking, though, is you know, how are the lives of black people going to be better and more empowered as a result of just all of this, right? So, yeah. you know, here's the thing. You know, white people don't love you. Like, like I think that that's, if, if, if black people would all just agree that white people don't love you, they ain't never gonna love you, and they ain't got to love you. You are not gonna get that white White people approval. don't owe you love. They are not your goddamn parents. You are so Your right. mama <laughs> owes you love. The white man does not. And I think if you get that through your thick skull, then then we can move forward. Yeah. It's like, yeah. can we all agree? Let's let's just start there. Let's start the basics. Yes, I all do right. agree. Yeah, everybody, give me a yes <laughs> in the chat if you agree that white people don't love you, and they probably ain't gonna really love you that much. And, and, and they don't, don't owe care. and they don't, they don't owe, owe you. Us. They don't owe you love. They don't. They you know you might want to choose to love them. All right. We a lot of us really love some love us some white folks. They I don't feel like they have to love us. A white man ain't got to love me. He's supposed to love his wife. He's supposed to love his kids. That's so true. Okay. You know, I don't I'm with you on this. Because let's keep it one, let's keep it one hundred. No disrespect. If you white, I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings, but I don't love you neither. I don't. I don't hate them. I just don't think about them. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know what I love? I love you. Yeah, I love you too. Mm, give me a kiss. <laughs> I love our children in the other room. I love those kids. Yes, I love my people. I love your people. Right. I love my people. So, so <laughs> I think that when you just start there, right? Yeah. Like they don't love you. They don't. They don't care about you. They're not going. They. They don't even owe it to you. Then that takes away ninety percent of the of the racial conversations we have in this country. I wonder how they feel when we ask for reparations. Uh, they probably are pissed about it. I know I'll be. <laughs> I'll be like, wait a minute. What do I got to do? with what my ancestors did for oh, 300 years ago. That, I hate that. Right, and that's a logical that argument. Right, and that's where that's where being gangster comes into play. That's straight like, gangster. Right, like, like, like <laughs> children suffer for the sins of their parents, right? So, you know, look, I might feel like I ain't got nothing to do with what my granddaddy did to you and your family, but if I'm living in a house that my granddaddy stole from your granddaddy, then I owe you that house. And it's up to you to make me give it back to you. Seriously, <laughs> no. It, oh, make me give it back to you. So mm -hmm. you, so you're not gonna. Your I'm heart not, is not gonna. Be no, big and be like, no. Oh, my heart, house. my heart will <laughs> never be that big. I'm not giving you shit. You gonna have to come take it. You gotta so, come take it. So when you talk about things like reparations, with white folks, their hearts ain't never gonna be big enough to give away fourteen trillion dollars. They are not. Not among the right. You people. gonna have to yeah. get gangster. You gonna have to be like Joe Pesci and Goodfellas. I love Joe Pesci. Remember that scene? Famous scene. Where he said, F you pay me. F Wait. you pay me. You remember that? Wait, Joe Pesci in what movie? In Goodfellas. Ooh. Oh, you know what? I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking Pesci in the um, oh gosh, it was the history of the CIA. What movie was that? The Good oh, Shepherd. The, the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd. So Joe Pesci in the Good Shepherd, you got to watch his clip. Boys, I've been trying to get you to watch that movie, The Good the Shepherd. Good, I watched The Good Shepherd. I saw. I didn't watch the whole movie, but I did see the clip. You gotta see the whole and I watched movie. Enough it's of deep. It. Really? But okay. anyway, so we love Joe Pesci's roles in films. Clearly. Well, Joe Pesci, Joe Pesci he brings it though. Well, you know what? I, I remember Joe Pesci in Goodfellas because there was that one scene. I think it was Pesci. Maybe it was. Okay. Maybe I got it wrong. Mm -hmm. But there was a part where the guy was like, you know, like I, I don't have your money because blah blah blah. He's mm -hmm. like, "F you, pay me." Yeah. And he's like, yeah, but, but I don't like, have it. <laughs> F you pay me. F you pay me. And that's what black people got to do. If black people okay. really want to get something out of these Democrats who don't respect your ass, uh -huh. they're going to have to literally say, F you pay me. Okay. Like, we will not vote for you. We we don't care what your excuses are. Um, If you can't go get the money, then that's fine. We just won't. You'll never get our vote again. OK, so let me tell you what his scene was in The Good Shepherd. Do you mm. remember? I think I remember he said the Negroes have their music. Yeah, he was like, the Irish has their land. 
he said the niggers, or I don't know how he said it. He said you they have their music. Isn't that interesting? And he yeah. said, Well, what do we have? And he's talking about the white Protestant Christian, you know, the wasp. He's like, We got the United States of America and all y'all just stopping by or something like that. So mm. that's a really good scenario about how this country was formed, how this country was made, and the fact that I don't owe you nothing and I don't love you. Mm. You know, I mean, that scene is really heavy. So I encourage everybody to go see that scene because that in a nutshell just tells you about how the United States of America operates. Well, if you mm -hmm. want to know, here's, okay. here's the reason why I don't feel sorry for Colin Kaepernick. Okay. Wow. And I just, you know, I, I'm going to just be keep it 100. Okay. So let me, let me actually, um, I'm actually show you all. This is why Colin Kaepernick is not going to yeah, take. He's not. And why the NFL is not a slave auction. <laughs> I, you know, don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, yes, yeah, it's, it's 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 kind of a brutal way to make a living, but it's but it, it does pay well if you're Colin Kaepernick. Well, do you so, think he's a little bitter because they won't? Yeah, he's, sign him. I, I'd be mad too. Well, be, he don't need I mean, to he, play football. What yeah, but well, football? he probably loves the game. Okay. You know, he he loves the game, right? So, um, so here's Kaepernick's numbers in terms of. Contract. This uh, the top is 2014 to 2017. The bottom is 2011 to 2014. So uh, here you can see his contract over six years. His six-year contract was 114 million. Signing bonus was 12 million. Average salary 19 million. Total guarantees 61 million. Guaranteed money. When was um, this? Was this, this before was, he took a knee or after he took a knee? This was during. Like it was during this second contract that he took a knee. I think it was 2016. Because I think he money. made more money since he took the knee. Well, I mean, he's made. I don't, he probably has. Who okay. Right. But yeah, and then the bottom part is 2011 and 2014. His first contract was four years, five million. His signing bonus was 2.2 million. Uh, average salary 1.2 million. So even when he was making garbage money, you know, he still got a guaranteed 3.8 million, right? So well, 3.8 is nothing compared to 100 million. 3.8 million is a lot of money. It is. It is a lot of money. That's a lot of. I mean, sure, it's not. You know, 3.8. It's, it's not a lot of money if you're an NFL quarterback. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Cap ain't struggling, right? He's not in the struggle, right? But that doesn't mean he doesn't deserve to be heard, right? That doesn't mm -hmm. mean that he doesn't have valid points. And what I would probably advise him on, if he and I were just sitting here rapping and talking, because I'm not dissing him at all. I'm not saying, like, oh, you're full of crap, you're crazy. No, I don't think you are at all. <clears throat> I think the stuff you're saying, I'm, I'm, it's really poignant, boys. Oh, thank you. Well, what I would say with, with I like Cap, it. what I would say with Cap, you know, is great. You know, I think the documentary is very entertaining. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's great that he's telling his story. Um, it's great to hear him talk. I wish he had talked a little more um, before. You know, especially last year, I think a lot of people would have wanted to hear his voice. Um, he did a lot of retweeting mm -hmm. from other people, stuff like that. And that's not the same as actually speaking up and putting your neck on the line and things like that. But but if you're going to do all that, I really think, you know, be real gangster with it. Like, seriously, like, OK, the white man, you need the white man's approval in the NFL. Why? Mm -hmm. Why? The, 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 the Chicago Bears were purchased for like one hundred dollars. They're now worth what two or three billion or something, mm. right? The the New York Jets, you know, <clears throat> teams like that, major NFL teams worth over a billion dollars, were all purchased for like a few hundred bucks, maybe a few thousand, you know. So, the you know we got all these athletes and entertainers that they wave in front of us on TV, talking about how rich they are, how powerful they are. Well, if you are always taking a knee for the white man, and because you need him to give you his approval for you to play football or do do the thing you love, then that to me says you ain't got no real power. Yeah, I was just going to say, where's the power? There's no power there. I don't see the power. And I see, you know, the money being, you know, that kind of lifestyle that I see a lot of athletes, you know, having. Like, you can't sustain that, mm -hmm. you know, for a long time. Yeah. and, and Unless well, you make some really intelligent decisions early on. Well, a lot of times, mm -hmm. I think the reason we don't fully manifest in terms of our power is because, first of all, I don't really know if we know exactly what power looks like. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people have borrowed power and they think it's real power. Like if somebody puts you on a TV show and they make you famous and give you a little money, you say, look at me, I've got power. But if you ain't really calling the shots, mm -hmm. then that's not power. Or if you get a fancy job, you're a, an executive at Merrill Lynch or whatever, and you, you think you have power, but 
but you don't really have any power because you can't even give your relatives a job without asking for your boss's permission. Mm -hmm. It's an to, illusion. It's right. an illusion of power. Right. Yeah. What power, power, institutional power means the control of institutions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I am a person who runs a little school that has a thousand kids in it and I decide what the curriculum is going to be, mm -hmm. I decide how the class is going to be structured, who's going to teach there. I have more power with that one school with a thousand kids than I would have if I were, you know, a one president of, the, of the, right, the, the head of a university, a faculty. Mm -hmm. right, or yeah. superintendent of Chicago Public Schools, yeah. right, you know, or if I am uh, an athlete, you know, who creates an, a league like, you know, Ice Cube has the big three and Kanye, you know, invested actually in Ice Cube's big oh, three did he? league. Yeah, that's what I just read. Okay. And, you know, you and I had personal conversations with both Ice Cube and Kanye. Mm -hmm. we, we know that they subscribe to Poweronomics from Dr. Claude Anderson. That's why we, we all know each other is because we all are students of, Dr. of Claude Anderson. Well, that's more power than being a high ranking official in the NBA or the NFL, because the NFL doesn't even have any black owners. So, you know, if you're an owner in the NFL or part owner, you think you have power, but you don't have power because power comes in the ability to change the lives in, of a, a significant number of the people where you come from. Like Malcolm X used to say, I don't care how much how well the white man treats me. I don't care how much he puts me on TV. I don't care how much money he pays me. If you're not, uh, if I'm not in a position to do the same thing for my people, then I don't accept any of that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't think I don't think guys get that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That feeling powerless is um, is a sad moment because it's it's almost like an illusion of inclusion. <laughs> it's like you think that you're in. There's so many times I thought that my word meant something at work <laughs> you know mm. like your opinion or your thoughts about something really meant something but there's actually other people really making the decisions and you ain't at the table you, yeah. you be thinking and, and there have been times actually very rarely where i did have a you know i was able to like have a word and you know what that feels like mm -hmm. you know yes no like cut them out no, they're not going to be here anymore. You know, so that is a certain feeling that you get. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, I yeah. think I think that I've, I've I've been saying this for a little bit. Um, and I'll probably keep saying it is, mm -hmm. you know, whenever I hear an entertainer talk about wealth and power and things like that, my question to them <clears throat> would be, you know, how many thousands of jobs have you created for Black people, mm -hmm. or how many hundreds of jobs have you created? Mm -hmm. You know, um, Elon Musk is powerful. He's created a million jobs. Jeff Bezos is powerful. He's created a million jobs for mostly white people. Um, how many black people, how many black celebrities do we have that have created thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs? Mm -hmm. Or do we just have prominent black people who get attention by complaining about their white boss? Right. Mm -hmm. That's what that is. You know, like, so I think with Kaepernick, I would have challenged the guys. I would have said, you know, why do you need a white man's permission to play football? Mm -hmm. Oh, because what? Because the white man owns the 49ers. That's his brand. The white man owns the NFL. That's his brand. But where's your motherfucking brand? Mm -hmm. Where's your institution? Mm -hmm. You know, you, 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 you know where you can go find a football field. You can get people to watch the game. You can get a lot. Watch the game. You can get people to watch the game, sponsor it. You can get people to play the game. People are just always talent out there. Yeah. 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 And it's uh, nothing but a thing. He could have used this money to do that. If that's yeah. what he was really right after right mm -hmm. like it's, it's you know it's just like um think about it. it's like if i'm playing in a basketball game and mm -hmm. i don't like the way the game's being run i don't like the rules i don't mm -hmm. i feel like the refs are cheating or whatever yep am i gonna keep playing the game and bitching or am i gonna get my ball and go home i'm well, like no what you're gonna do is do a documentary on it so, so that you can tell on, so that you can tell on people you know what i would do you can tell on I white would, people being white so <laughs> i would grab my ball and i would be like i got a court near my house and yeah. my friends are gonna be the referees on this court if you want to play me you come to my house i'm not playing at your house period <laughs> And, and the reason a lot, I think the reason that, that we don't have that, that vision all the time is because it's, it's where, where people are into the fast, easy route to the big money, mm -hmm. right? Like you can go out and get an NFL contract and get, you know, 50 million, hundred million dollars because the white man's ready to write you that check. Right. But in order, in, in terms of doing the grind necessary to build your own NBA or your own NFL, where you're not making, you know, 30 million a year, you might lose 10 million a year. You know, for a little while, or you might only make two million a year. 
a lot of guys don't want to take that pay cut, right? So so uh. ultimately, so like Angel, Angel asked a good question. She says, Where's your league, Dr. Boyce? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. Excellent question. Well, Angel. you know, okay. No, let no, me show, well, let me show I want to say something. Well, let me show Can I, I respond to that? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. You got your league because you weren't playing at Syracuse. No, they wouldn't let you that's play. That's my motherfucking league. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all saw my league. Not we 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 ain't we didn't ask nobody <laughs> from it. We the all black national convention angel. So you should you should have been there. It was amazing. That that's our league. Yeah, like, you know. I was yeah. gonna say that. Go mm -hmm. ahead. No, that's say? what I was gonna, just gonna say. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. That's okay. You stole my thunder a little bit, but that's all right. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> you got no, all no. got all excited, didn't you, boys? Yeah, yeah. I'm just <laughs> like, no, I I haven't. I I I I don't even know what it feels like to be under the white man's thumb like that. I I just I mean I'm not saying, mm -hmm. you know. Here's the thing. I mean, and when I did that, it wasn't easy. It was like, yeah, yeah. I walked away from a very high salary. I walked away from, quote unquote, job security. I walked away from, you know, easy status and credibility. But as a result of pouring into myself and pouring into my community, I own I own about eight brands that I wouldn't sell for less than a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Like seriously, even yeah. my even my name is worth millions of dollars now, right? And and that's what I'm saying when I talk about these guys. Like, so Cap is mad because he can't play for the 49ers. Well, maybe that's God's way of saying that you're supposed to start your own team in your own league. That would be so great. Like, how he got to do is just follow what Ice Cube did. Yeah, he could just follow. I wonder do they know each other? That would be really interesting. Like he could just follow that. We would sponsor something, wouldn't we? Yeah, I mean, you know, if he support. started his own league, I would support it. Oh, of course. I mean, yeah, I think I think that here's the thing, right? Be wonderful. Like, like in order to build a um mm -hmm. in order to build a sports league it and make a, make millions of dollars, right? Right off the bat. Mm -hmm. You you wouldn't make the money that you're making now, right? Cuz it's profitable to sell yourself into slavery. <clears throat> right? It's profitable just to go to the white man and say Sign me up for your team and you give me the big contract because he's got the infrastructure. He's been around. He's been doing this for 100 years. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but if you if, if LeBron and let's say LeBron and his 10 richest friends all got together and said, let's create an NBA, a version of the NBA. Oh, like the Negro Leagues, like the Negro well, they wouldn't Baseball have, they, League. Right, yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, but it wouldn't have to be called the Negro Leagues. It yeah, could, but I'm just referring back to the, the Negro League. Yeah. Yeah. Baseball. So if they decided to create their own sports league, right? And then what do, what do you need? Well, first of all, you need to have a basketball court. I don't know. What do y'all think? Do y'all think, do you think you can get, um, you think you can get a basketball court? Or an that, arena? I'm kidding. I'm being silly. <laughs> that, right. We, no, you don't even need an arena. You, like, do you know, like Rucker, Rucker um, Park in New York? Mm -hmm. Like all the legends play at Rucker Park. They could televise games at Rucker Park, you know, because Rucker Park's famous like that. Right? Or we can watch it in the metaverse, boys. Stop that. Be quiet. So, so seriously, though. <laughs> okay, picture. go ahead. No, mm -hmm. I'm serious. I'm serious. Okay. So they, they, you know, so you, all you need is a court. <laughs> you mm -hmm. need some basketball players. We got plenty of those. And then you need an audience. Well, if LeBron and 10 of his richest friends all got together, they got probably a billion followers on social media. That's your audience. You just broadcast the games on social media. And then at that point you start making money because corporations will go wherever the audience is mm -hmm. so you go to the corporations and you say we got you know we had a game last week and 18 million people watched it they're going to want to sponsor that then then you're making your money and you've got all these businesses that are built out of that like you think about the all black national convention mm -hmm. we could we sold out of vendor spots quickly yeah because people came where the people were coming the vendors came where the people were so they were like, oh, we we have a black owned business. We're going to sell our products at the convention because there are all these black people there. Right. So what happens is that when you gather people together, you create your own economy. So like a lot of money. Sure. We, you know, uh, you know, our organization was able to make the money back that we invested. But a lot of people made a ton of money at that convention. Jay Ortiz, the rapper out of Philly, he made four thousand dollars. That selling, is so great. Selling his artwork. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so so what my point is to say, like, let me, uh, I'm see, I got a picture of Jay. That's Jay Ortiz, by the way. Uh, Jay was at the convention. 
He's a cool dude. Very smart guy. He's like a visionary. He's very Kanye Westish. He's so creative. That's super, the what's, super that's creative. the biggest thing. Yeah. His creativity. I mean, he just lives in that creative space. Yeah, it's he's pretty super, cool. Very creative. Yeah. And um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I mean, so so my point is to say that, you know, I, I, I think that the guys and I, I'm not mad at them. I think that maybe you always make jokes. You always say that because I'm 50, I shake my fist at the air. Yeah, don't like, shake your fist in the air. So I'm not shaking it makes my fist at the air. Much older than you know 50. what? You know what it is. Uh -huh. It makes me want to. I wish I could like really talk to them. I've been to a few athletes. Like, there's a few athletes I talked. There was one brother that played um, for the University of Michigan. That um, uh, he was. Like, I don't know if he's an NFL or not. I think he played for a little while, but he um he has this really cool business, and we were talking. I'd like to talk to them more about sovereignty and what that looks like. Right. You know, like um, like I talked to somebody, you know, it's pretty well known. And I said, why are those NBA players all wearing those Black Lives Matter T-shirts? And he said, well, you know how it is. The teams, the teams make them do it. And I said, OK, I kind of get that. But, you know, when it comes to an important issue in terms of how to express your blackness. I don't really think that a guy who makes 20 million a year can say I'm only doing this because my boss told me to do it. Like, you know, like manhood and masculinity, part of that, in my view, and real power means the ability to kind of manifest. Well, they had to do something. They couldn't lose all those players. Yeah, they, they had did. to do right. something to kind of like make them feel like, hey, we're in your corner. <laughs> we hear you. Yeah, they did. <laughs> they had did. to do something because they knew they could not have a bunch of disgruntled black people on their teams. Yeah. Joining, yeah. joining together. <laughs> yeah. and but no, That could not have. That movement needed to have been squashed. Right? That's true. But the thing was that mm -hmm. that a lot of like the real black folks who are really out in the streets, really doing the work, really building in the community, they saw right through the black. Lives yeah, they Matter did. Movement. They were like, oh, no, this is the LGBT movement that has put a black face on it, mm -hmm. you know, and this was not our movement. And yeah. if you notice, the Black Lives Matter movement has pretty much all but disappeared after the election well we started wondering like where did black lives matter come from who's funding this right you know why is this why is this such an organized organization that popped out of nowhere like right and now it's gone make sense. now it's gone it was designed to win an election it was designed to neutralize us right black lives matter was a movement <laughs> that was pretty much created because they were trying to get trump out of office Gosh. now and biden and get biden into office mm -hmm. now that they got biden into office even the, the Black Lives Matter leadership can't even get him on the phone. Remember, they were talking about how they were trying to talk to the Biden administration <laughs> after they used them up like a bunch of They homes. were attached at the hip yeah. come the election. Yeah. 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 And, and so so what I, what I said to the guy was I said, these black men need to have their own movement. They, they need really to be do. the leadership and the decision makers in that movement. Don't follow somebody else's lead because there's a lot of Trojan horses out here. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think with um with Cap, I, I think he's on the he's trying to be on the right path. But mm -hmm. I think you when you're talking about quote unquote leadership, the question is what are the deliverables of that leadership? You know, mm -hmm. and I don't know what the deliverables are. Yeah, I mean it really yeah, I mean look at look at Colin Kaepernick. I mean he's dressed like a Black Panther. Right. <laughs> like someone in the Black Panther party with their big afro. So he has like the optics. Yeah, of yeah. something that's oh, you yeah. know it's cool. His <laughs> afro is like the coolest thing ever, and the core rolls are cool. And, and who's the lady? Is that is that's that his, his lady? Her name's Anessa or something. Gosh, they look like twins. Yeah, they do. They, do <laughs> they look, look like so much alike. Yeah, so yeah, she tweets. She tweets for him all the time. She, really? That's yeah, that, her job is to tweet I for guess him. She's the family maybe tweeter. I should I should get a Twitter account and tweet for you boys. <laughs> yeah, maybe you should. <laughs> that's um. That's uh. That's it. Those are his parents the nice people that adopted them they yeah they were they were kind of clueless about what was going on with black people they, I, i'm I they just were couldn't, they were they were like I, read a history book or something yeah that's true well at least they were portrayed as clueless yeah but i kind of i don't know I, I i guess maybe learning his culture would have helped for sure and also you have to question alone you have to question a little bit about, you know, when white folks are adopting black babies, but at the same time, um, I'd rather have a black baby adopted by a white family that loves them than to have them in the system. Right. Yeah, that's true. And, yeah. you know, and also once again, to be honest with you, if I were to adopt a white child, which I don't know why I would, but if I were, I wouldn't spend time teaching him how to be white. It wouldn't be a priority for me. I would teach him just how to be a good person. 
Well, that would know. be that would be doing the child a disservice. I mean, there are a lot of white people who have very strong uh, cultural heritage, you know, with Italian culture and I don't know uh, Polish culture. <laughs> you know, I mean, you should you should I think when you adopt someone, you should try to get into like where they came from and their origin and try to help them to develop their own identity because you don't want them lost when they grow up. That's true. So that would be doing them a disservice, boys. Yeah, it would be. It would be. <laughs> By the way, yeah. um, this is Pillow Talk with Dr. Boyce and Dr. Alicia Watkins. And I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins. This is my wife, Dr. Alicia. She is a licensed couples counselor and full professor of social work. And my PhD is in finance, in case you want to know our backgrounds and where we're coming from. Um, and also, Alicia's website and Instagram is Coaching with Dr. Alicia. Mm-hmm. So you can go to coachingwithdralicia.com if you want to check her out and see what she's up to. And um, she counsels couples and stuff like that. Um, if you could, please hit the thumbs up button. Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. Please do that right now. <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, so let me just kind of, I, I probably feel like, you know, when it came comes to Kaepernick's documentary, I almost wish I could have made like a list, like a short list of the things that I observed, you know. Yeah, and, we should have been taking notes because it was a right. lot in there. Right. And And yeah. first of all, it was well produced. It's worth watching. Would yeah, Ava DuVernay, come on. Yeah, well, Ava DuVernay's. You know, she's great. good. Well, you know, you know, Madam President, who came to the convention, she worked with Ava DuVernay and Tyler Perry and mm-hmm. Oprah. Think, and Oprah. Oprah, mm-hmm. Ava DuVernay, and Tyler Perry. Yeah, Madam President was at the convention. Um, so, you know, I would say that it's worth watching. And shout out, you know, to Ava DuVernay for doing what she does. Um, and I think that there is a role for. Mm-hmm. Um, what was done in this documentary, right? I think that what is oversold to us as Black people, which has not proven to give us any progress and real power, is this um, over-commitment to integrationist ideologies related to, like, things like white allies. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that that we should sit around being mad at white people, and I'm not saying that we should separate from white people. I'm just saying that the answer to your oppression does not lie within getting acceptance from your oppressor, right? The, the, the oppressor, the oppression will not end because the oppressor decides to just be nice to you and to accept And give you. them your house. <laughs> right. Come, the, come on in. Right. The, yeah. We stole this house from you. Just come on in. Yeah, yeah. They're not going to give you their house. They're not, yeah. They're not going to see you as their equal. Yeah. And, and they shouldn't. Why? Because think about it. It, it, I have a house, right? I run a business. It's a black owned business. The black business was Boyce Watkins Enterprises is very black. You know, if you come into my company and you're white, you're going to probably have to adjust to our culture. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, like, like this is our house. We built this house. This is B1 black first. Black first could be accused of being black supremacist. <laughs> you know, I mean, you could say that, right? And I'm not going to say it is or isn't, but what I will say is, you know, that black people, instead of trying to fit into the white man's house, we need to learn how to build our own house mm-hmm. and then let them fit into our shit, you know? And so so I, I kind of feel like, um, like, I think that Ava DuVernay's documentary, The 13th, was very important. I could not sit through it. It was just too, I got through like the first 10 minutes and I turned it off. I just couldn't get through. The, she well, did the thirteenth. Was it called the thirteenth? I didn't think she did. I thought she did the one with the the four boys in New York. She who was accused too. of raping. She did. I think she did that too. That that um lady. She did thirteen. I didn't know she did. 13. I think so. They, they that was 13. really hard. It was like a horror film. I, I can't watch it because okay. it. I already know everything that's in it. Yeah, and you I don't know? want to relive that. Yeah, it's see that. Tough. That's the thing. Here's it the, hurts to relive that. Well, here's what you know? um here's what I've noticed, right? When you talk about race, there are these classes of black people who make content so they can educate white people. Mm-hmm. You know, like Ken, when Kendu Isaacs wrote his book on anti-racism and uh, somebody sent it to me because I was actually in it. He, he re- mentioned me somewhere near the end of the book. It became this New York Times bestseller. Oh, the new racism or something? It's, it's the, something on okay. anti-racism. Right. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And what I conclude from books like that is that they're designed to educate white people. Okay. And they're educating them with this, what I believe this false hope that white people will see the light. They're going to change their systems and they're going to start treating black people well. And I don't believe in that, that fight. I believe that 
what matters is not how white people treat black people, but as George Frazier says, it's, it's about how black people treat black people. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that we are the key. So you're, adv- you're advocating for non-participation in their system. I'm saying that if you don't like a system, get the fuck out the system. Okay. You know, mm-hmm. systems are created. Why am I? Why am I even investing in your system if I don't mm-hmm. want? If it's not working for me. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's like if you're not. You know, if 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 you're being you know disrespected in a marriage. You know, some say you should get a new marriage. You know, mm-hmm. um, if you are if you're disrespected on your job. Why are you? Do, do you have to? Do you have <laughs> yeah. to be at that job? Yeah. You know. Well, hey, last I heard, that's exactly what people are doing. Yeah. They're like, they're like, yeah, I got the great out. resignation. <laughs> the great resignation. People are like, I'm done with this. Yeah. You had me. You gave here. me a chance to sit at home and do nothing, mm-hmm. and sit and think and contemplate while we while I try to stay away from this um, pandemic and um, the virus, you know, I'm trying to stay away from it all. I'm sitting at home thinking, well, you know, it reminds me of like, mm-hmm. like a really bad relationship where the couple takes a break and then they realize, then they realize this was way better. The person's like, <laughs> I'm having so much fun without you. <laughs> I've moved on to someone else. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for letting us, we br- get some yep. space. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and then there's so many people who are realizing that I can get the work done in my house. Mm-hmm. And then some, yeah. And then get all get all this other stuff done because you waste so much time commuting back and forth. It's just ridiculous. So mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I totally get it. Well, so people are waking up. Well, people are. Um, I'm not a Marxist, right? Okay. But I've studied enough Marxism to appreciate some of the good ideas of Marxism. Mm-hmm. And uh, Marxist and Marx did a really good job of critiquing capitalism by kind of basically making a very simple point that this is my my limited interpretation of some small aspect of what he said. And I, this is because of something I've always said, you know, God did not put you on this earth to spend most of your waking hours serving a corporate, a corporation Mm -hmm. and sitting on the corporate plantation. You were just trained to believe that's what you're supposed to do, you know? And, and so when people get a chance to know what life is like without Mm -hmm. the corporation being the center of their existence, Mm -hmm. they say, man, I like this. This is, this is great. And they don't go back. Yeah. And I think that's what Colin Kaepernick, um, he started his documentary with that point. He's like, we've all been conditioned. We've all been conditioned to serve Mm -hmm. other people, not ourselves, but to serve other people's interests. That was the very first episode of the documentary. So there's some poignant parts in there. I I really like the part where um, he was trying to be, he had challenges in his life trying to be a quarterback. And, you know, he's like, I want to be the best quarterback. And what he did to kind of overcome Mm-hmm. You know, so that, that was good. Be. That I, was really I enjoyed good. That. Like, I like watching those instances because I related to my life and I related to what I see other people go through. You know, all of those little challenges and you overcome them and you're better for it. Well, you know, yeah. I respect Colin as an athlete because he um, was able to. I mean, anybody that can become an NFL quarterback and and win the Super Bowl. That's a big deal. It's usually pretty extraordinary what he does, you know. So I, you know, just as myself being a former athlete, like I was really, you know, I was really. Oh, that's right, that. your track star life. I was, I, I was not a track star. You were a track star in my head when I explain you to people. You know, I'm like, oh, he was a track star in high school. Well, baby, that means you would be lying. I'm not lying. I was, I was cap- no cap, no cap. <laughs> I, I, you know, I was captain. I was actually a cap. I was captain of my track team. That's right. And you but, I, that but spot. I was not. I was not captain because I was a star. You know, I was captain because I um I had a good work ethic and I was very mature for my age. Were you really? Yeah, yeah, I was smart. All them dummies. I'm oh, don't be calling people they would just be doing stupid stuff like i'd be like why are you going out and getting drunk every night like you're going to die in a car crash like well, seriously you know so they so, was kicking it having fun yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> like, now you're kicking it in prison <laughs> they're not but, in, okay just because you drink well you know i got in prison. Prison. girl please i got i got friends when you're a black man you gotta be careful because i got friends in jail friends that got killed friends that are on dope you know, so you, great. So you what's gotta, up with your friends? I well, don't have my friends living their best life. Yeah, yeah. Being a black man is tough. I mean, you know, so I think that some of what Cap, I mean, like, I think overall, mm-hmm. Colin Kaepernick is represents more good than bad, right? I really agree. I, I think I would love to. 
coach okay. him. I would, yes, that's what I was going to say. Wait, wait, wait. You cut uh-huh. me off. Hold on. I would love to coach him on how to take your blackness to the next level. Like every time you find that the white man has built a barrier to you, how do you get around that barrier? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and do it in a way where your sacrifice doesn't just benefit Colin Kaepernick, right? Colin, Colin's going to be fine. Colin in the NFL, that was pretty much just a labor dispute. He was, <laughs> he was pissed off because they took his job. And yeah. so, so he goes and he's protesting to say, they took my job. And people say, we're going to boycott the NFL because we want you to give Colin Kaepernick back his job. Well, Colin Kaepernick getting his job back doesn't do a whole lot for the black community. Now, Colin Kaepernick leaving his job and starting a professional sports league with, you know, with his celebrity friends. Now that impacts the black community. Yes. Yes. Or Colin Kaepernick saying, you know, convincing Nike to give him, you know, a a $300 million fund to build black owned schools run by black people with no strings attached all across the United States. That That benefits would be great. Right. Or Colin Kaepernick Mm -hmm. forcing uh, Nike to give him millions of dollars like three, four hundred million dollars to make loans to black owned businesses. <gasps> right. Would again, be nice. again, and the key idea though, it has to be done with no strings attached. Because typically when the white man gives out his money, he tells you what to do with that money. Mm-hmm. He influences you with his economic power. He does it all around the world. And that's how that's why black people are under um so much oppression is because Yeah, because it's like you gotta get on our agenda. Right. And if you do not help push our agenda ahead, then goodbye to you. <laughs> We're gonna right. go on to the next one. Right, right, right. Yeah. So so to me, the million dollar question of whether or not you're Can't free. be hating on them. But he, right, so mm-hmm. here's 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 the here's the thing, right? The million dollar question of whether or not you're a free black man or black woman, one of them, one of the million dollar questions could be, could you take the money that you have and write a check for $10 million to the nation of Islam and not have white people cancel you. If you could do that Mm -hmm. and still keep it moving, then that to me is a free black man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we know that we, we, you know, you might not agree with everything with the nation of Islam or whatever, but we know that black people love Farrakhan and the nation. And respect them. Right. Right. Even people that don't like them, respect them. White people can't stand them. White people mislabel them. As and we're confused. Boy. Like, what do you mean? Right, right. Oh, Farrakhan's out what? killing people. He's dangerous. He's doing nothing. What are you talking about? No, Y'all you're, kill more people. Than right. This. You're dangerous. No, your yeah. your OxyContin is dangerous. Your your big <laughs> your big pharma is dangerous. Like, oh, your greasy ass food is dangerous. That kills black people. Your GMO. Farrakhan <laughs> ain't killed nobody. Like, so stop it. Seriously. So 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 here's the thing. My point is to say that that. That's one of the litmus tests you can use to say, mm-hmm. you know, are you truly, do you truly have, because I can, I, I speak positively about the nation all day, every day. I had, I had brothers, I had Riza Islam at the convention. I know he's on the FBI, CIA watch list. I did not give a shit. A Nuri Muhammad was up there. Nuri Muhammad is a high ranking official. He's on, I think he might be on the no fly list or something like that. So, so they don't like him either. I did not care. It right? doesn't seem like they care. They have big smiles on their face. They didn't. We had a great time, right? <laughs> we had a great time because those are good people. Yeah, they were. Those are good people, and 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 it's only, yeah, it's only sort of that weird, um, weirdness of America that takes good black people and somehow morphs them into bad black people. Mm-hmm. Well, you it's know, okay because we see them. We see you. We see you, Nuri. We see you. We see you as you are, mm-hmm. and we accept you. Yeah. And that's why he had a smile on his face. He could care less <laughs> about yeah, but, a no-fly list. Or yeah, you name all on. you name all those brothers. I named yeah. Nuri, um, Riza, Farrakhan. I have spent a significant amount of time mm-hmm. with all those brothers, and whether you disagree with them or not, you know those are good people. They really are. But they are. I mean, they are. They greet you with a smile. They're very friendly, very helpful, very supportive, and 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 so you know. I, I think I use the nation of Islam as a litmus test, right? Right. Because you can go to a lot of college campuses, though, where the black people have been trained to consider the nation of Islam to be a hate group, and that, to me, is a result of the brainwashing and the indoctrination. I, I told you when I spoke at um, University of California, Long Beach, with Farrakhan, and the black students had been um, brought in to protest. Mm-hmm. They they chose to come in and protest Farrakhan. 
by disrespecting him. They, they all came in and took a seat and then got up and walked out in the middle of his speech. You know, and, and, and to me, I, th- I found that to be interesting because what occurs is that a lot of times I think the reason we're not liberated is because the path that we think will lead to our liberation is actually leading to our incarceration psychologically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, you think you're hustling forward, but really you're hustling backward. And that's why your community has not made any progress in the last 60 years, despite the fact that you got more educated black people than ever, despite the fact that you got more black politicians than ever, despite the fact that you got, you know, all these Black Lives Matter and everything else popping off. Where's the progress? You ain't having you ain't getting no progress. You know, mm-hmm. and I, so I think that we don't you, in order to make progress, you got to know what progress looks like. Period. Mm-hmm. What do you think, babe? Gotcha. Yeah. Makes sense to me. Yeah. Are you ready for our race tomorrow? I'm yeah. thinking about this nine miles. 15K tomorrow. Boys. Oh, my God. She talked me into doing 15K. I did not talk you into it. I just said, do you want to do it? Yes or no? And you said yes. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Well, I'll do anything for you. you. You don't have to do it for me. Well, you talked me into it. My love for you is not dependent mm-hmm. on whether you do a 15K. It's like what Belle Bivdevo said. Never trust a big button to smile. And you have both. I'm poison? You is that are, what you calling me? You might be. <laughs> oh, my gosh. No. You're going to blame me. All I did was ask a question. You could have denied. Poison. You could have said no. Poison. Po- po- poison. Oh, my God. Okay. Yeah. So, um. We got to get to bed, too. We do. We do. We do. No, I mean, I agree with you, boys. It just makes sense. Um, we'll see what the rest of this documentary goes. I mean, it seems like it's going through his development, his stages of development. And I want to see what the second half is going to be. Will uh, give us. Yeah, I think I think Cap is, is is does more good than harm. Yeah. Right. And I think the Cap. Uh, it I took th- courage. I think the documentary is worth watching. Yeah. And I think it took mm-hmm. courage. Um, I look forward to seeing the next step of his evolution. Right. Like, mm-hmm. I think that um, now that people are understanding things like wealth, et cetera you know, you're starting to incorporate that into our black civil rights movements. And what I encourage people to also do is make sure that when you're talking about liberating black people in America, you're not over borrowing ideologies from other people that have used black people as political pawns, right? Mm-hmm. Repu- like Republican Democrats stuff, getting too caught up in that, you know, you're, you're just being used. The Republicans use you, the Democrats use you. Um, if you talk about even Marxism, the fact that the Black Lives Matter leadership were a bunch of trained or group of trained Marxists, mm-hmm. um, you know, Marxism is not the same as what we are going through as black people in our struggle, right? Black leadership does not have to come, you know, as Marxism in blackface and, or capitalism in blackface, right? It needs to come with blackness in a blackface. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, because when you start telling me that all rich people are evil, which that's kind of, unfortunately, that's that's the way the Marxist message gets sort of warped sometimes, is that, you know, that, that businesses are bad and wealthy people are terrible. Well, then what happens is you run into what I call the Sean King dilemma. The Sean King dilemma was that uh, the way people exposed him and ended up tearing him down is he spent, he and Patrice Cullors, the head of Black Lives Matter, they spent a lot of time trying to do what they thought was good work on behalf of the black community. And then next thing you know, white Republicans are calling them out because mm-hmm. they, they live in a nice house. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't believe that black be, that being black and being powerful means you need to live in a raggedy house. There's nothing about being black that says you got to be raggedy. There's nothing about being black that says you got to be poor. Nothing about being black that says that your life has to be miserable. You can be rich like Colin Kaepernick and have millions of dollars in the bank and still be the blackest person in the room. So I, I personally think that as black people, we've got to mm-hmm. define our own movements, mm-hmm. you know, get in the room, figure out who the hell we want to be, and then tell the world who we are instead of allowing people to bring their prepackaged mm-hmm. ideology mm-hmm. and using black people to push forward with their agenda. Because we always get thrown off the bus. We get put at the back of the bus, and then when the bus gets to the bus stop, they throw us off of it. Mm-hmm. That's why B1, right? So, I mean, I think that um, with the capitalist system, it's just exploitation of workers. I think that's the biggest one. It's mm-hmm. like the salaries are so suppressed. Yeah. And you're just working in this factory, and you're not even making enough money to feed your family. And you're working every day hard every day. And you see the people at the top, like, really eating good. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that's going to create this Marxist sort of movement. Yeah. People are just sick of it. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cap- yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't in any way um, defend the way capitalism is done in America. It's it's mm-hmm. getting worse every single generation, and Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos have become the Rockefeller and Carnegie of our time. Yeah, and it's not, it's not healthy. It's not good for America. But again, that's a little bit different in my view from what black people are trying to do. You know, mm-hmm. we're not out here trying to conquer the whole world. We're just trying to maintain our sovereignty, which mm-hmm. means that we we have our own space where we get to make the decisions. Again, black core three, educate our own children, create our own jobs, support black businesses. If you start with those three things, then you can get 80% of what you need as black people. Mm-hmm. All right, guys, well, we're about to get out of here. Um, uh, hit the thumbs up button, share, subscribe button. My Instagram is the real boys walking. Some of you are asking where you can get my this is the most cool t-shirts I, I showed you. Or I showed Which you my one? this one right here. Where I I, I I actually that was one I made. Um did you make that one? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I because I was like, I'm Oh not, I'm my not, goodness. Yeah, I I have Democrats accusing me of being a Republican and Republicans accusing me of being a Democrat. And I basically let them all know, like, no, I'm 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 I vote for the black party. That's it's it. so funny. You know, when you wear that shirt in public, white people mm-hmm. just look at you like, hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Have you noticed? No, I haven't. I okay, care. I've noticed. Yeah, I don't even. I I do. I give. I just don't care. I, yeah. I I don't even care enough about what other people. Not think even to. just white. Just people in general. Yeah, they, they just kind of give you a, a side. They, right. they they turn their head to the side, like, huh? Right, but my people yeah. get it, and that's all that matters to me. No, I mean, I think people yeah. do get it. Is mm. what I'm saying. Oh, you but I just think it. they're okay. just they're like, okay, a little bit thrown off. Yeah. True that. The I nerve of you boys. No, but well, the nerve, the nerve of a <laughs> black man to actually have his own mind. Oh my God. Yeah. So anyway, wokeblacktees.com. Yeah. That's where you can actually get a shirt like that. If you want to, we have a bunch of smart alecky shirts. Just go take a look at the page. <laughs> and, and if you, if you're a smart alec like me, you, you probably enjoy the shirts. All right, guys, we're about to go. And, um, and also I'll mention Alicia's, um, website and her Instagram is coaching with Dr. Alicia. So, Feel free to go to coachingwithdralicia.com if you want to see more about, about Alicia. All right, guys, please hit the thumbs up, share, subscribe button. I'm out of here, guys. Uh, we will talk to you later. See okay. you soon. Goodbye, everyone.